Welcome, everybody, and thank you, and good afternoon. Welcome to this presentation from the National Council of Nonprofits, Federal COVID-19 Legislation, What Do They Mean for Nonprofits? With that, let me turn things over to Tim Delaney, President and CEO of the National Council of Nonprofits. Thanks, Rick. On behalf of the networks of the National Council of Nonprofits, I welcome you and bid you good afternoon, good morning, and aloha, wherever you are. Uh, our network spans the entire country uh, with six time zones. I want to thank you for joining the webinar today, and more importantly, to thank you all for the service to people in your local communities. What you do is important, and that's why we want to make sure that you have the information that you need to be as effective as possible, and that you have a voice in Congress, at your state legislatures, uh, and at your local government. Today's webinar is designed to shine the light on some of these sometimes dense federal statutes. And as we are going through these, uh, I will uh, just let you know that uh, the National Council of Nonprofits is, in fact, the nation's largest network of charitable nonprofits, uh, coast to coast, border to border, as you see there on the map. Um, we are sector wide in our scope meaning we're not just the arts and culture, not just education, not just faith-based, not just human services, not just any, but rather all. Uh, and that is where we get our strength is to bring together nonprofits from uh, all sectors and um, all missions so that we can join forces and work together to make our communities better. Um, is uh, next slide. Thank you, Rick. The legislation that we're going to talk about today is primarily phases two and three, but it's important to know uh, that there was a predecessor. In phase one, Congress passed um, a, a bill that got some emergency money out for testing um, and some other activities uh, for the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in phase two, uh, you'll hear uh, much more about, it was the Families First Act, um, and that bill uh, is one that the nonprofit community came together um, and worked with Congress and made sure that nonprofits were a part of the solution and not left out. In phase three, the CARES Act, again, the nonprofit community came together uh, and working uh, in a strong coalition, we were able to make sure that issues of sector-wide importance were included in that legislation. Um, the uh, uh, CARES Act 4 is actually, um, it, it is being called a CARES Act 2.0 but there has been some breaking news today that uh, the Senate is looking at um, taking action by unanimous consent tomorrow. They are looking at approximately $250 billion to add to um, the various uh, funding mechanisms in the phase three CARES Act. So um, at this point in time, I don't know if they're gonna call it phase um, 3.25 or something else, uh, but it is there. Uh, meanwhile, there are discussions about the CARES Act 2.0 that would include even more provisions. Um, by the way, if the Senate does act tomorrow by unanimous consent, uh, they of course are uh, out in their own homes in their own states, uh, so they will not be physically voting, but they have a procedure that they can use for unanimous consent will then go over to the House, and um, the speculation is that the House will then deal with it on Friday in similar fashion. That has not been determined, uh, but that is how it would work to make sure that more resources get out there. Um, Rick, can you go back to the previous slide um, on uh, the map there? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with your state associations, uh, I would encourage you to go to our main website there, um, councilofnonprofits.org, uh, and you will uh, be able to see uh, a, a scroll piece that allows you to uh, find your state association of nonprofits. I would encourage you to do so 
There are actions happening right now in the states as well as in Congress. And I would submit that everybody needs to know what is happening and everybody needs to be able to use their voices to make sure that nonprofits are not left out of the policymaking process uh, and the loan programs and everything else that is occurring at the federal, state, and local levels. So if you are not a member of your state association, please do so. Your voice is needed to make sure uh, that uh, our elected officials understand the importance of nonprofits and how much society and governments are relying on nonprofits to be there. Likewise, if you happen to be a funder, I would encourage you, uh, if you've not supported your state association of nonprofits, I would encourage you to do so. They are the communications pipeline, as well as advocates for nonprofits, getting good quality information out there. Next slide. So oh, in our materials today, we are going to uh, talk about not only the Families First Act and the CARES Act, but there are also some other federal actions that have occurred and will be occurring. So we want to make sure people are aware of that. Uh, we will have questions and answers, uh, and then we will um, turn to uh, some things that you um, need to know about securing financing, and then some advocacy issues as I mentioned, uh, happening at the state, at local, and federal levels. Slide. Uh, the people that you'll be hearing today, um, my colleague, uh, David Thompson, uh, will be speaking. He is our Vice President of Public Affairs. Uh, David is um, an attorney. Uh, he is a gifted advocate. Um, and I, I will not go into all the commercials that he or Tiffany have earned. Um, Tiffany is our policy counsel, uh, Tiffany Gorley Carter. Um, she is also an attorney. I'm an attorney. The three of us are giving you the best um, interpretations, the, the best reading of the various laws that we could possibly give you. This is our best understanding. Uh, but not all the federal rules, regulations, and guidelines have even come out yet. Uh, in fact, when we gave the webinar last week, and um, uh, then uh, 16,000 plus registered for that, and uh, another 10,000 or so have watched it on YouTube, um, that's uh, a lot of people who are looking at that before any of the federal regs, rules, or guidelines came out. Since then, um, we are seeing them roll out, uh, and it's ever-changing. When you see materials on our website, um, and David will be reviewing them here for you, know that we are updating those daily if there are any changes. So we want to make sure you have the latest information. Not only are there not any federal rules, regs, or guidelines, but there are not any state rules, regs, or guidelines at this time. Right. And so those will be forthcoming. Um, and uh, everybody needs to be alert for those. So again, everything that you're going to be hearing is our very best uh, that based on what we have now. Uh, however, even though we are all attorneys, we are not your attorneys. We are not providing legal or financial advice to any specific um, organization or individual. Uh, this is educational material that we are providing, not legal advice. Um, sorry for the disclaimer, but as attorneys, we need to do that. Next slide. And now, uh, as we go into um, the Family First Act, um, I want to turn things over to my colleague, David Thompson, who will walk us through that and then answer some questions that have been coming in, uh, even as the show has started. And as Rick said, 500 before this show. Thank you, Tim. Um, Pins down, everybody. As Tim said, as Rick said, this is being recorded. You will get the slides, so please listen. Please type in your questions. We already have a batch that have come in and they're rolling in. That is great. We want to share what we know and we want to hear what you're asking because it may be you're asking things, most likely you're asking things that we have not considered. And we have a lot of faith-based uh, groups on this call today. So uh, 
We're expecting to hear questions we're not used to hearing, and we want to get you the right answer, and we want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to comply, everyone has the opportunity to treat their employees right, and to keep their missions going and contribute to their communities. So, first up, this is the Families First Act. It was passed way back in early March, a long time ago. Uh, it has two key provisions that we're going to talk about. One is the paid sick, and fam paid sick and family leave. Those are mandates to some employers, not all. And then the refundable tax credits that reimburse nonprofits for providing it. And then there's some modifications. Let's do the next slide. The big top line topic subject on the issue of the paid leave requirements of the Families First Act. You see the employee uh, poster that's on the screen there. Department of Labor issued that a week or so ago. And nonprofits that are open should have that posted on their, uh, on their uh, poster board with all their other employee rights uh, documents. It's interesting though, this paid leave requirement only applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. Let me come back to defining that. Well, fewer than 500 employees. That means the uh, full-time and part-time does not include, when you're doing the count, it does not include independent contractors. So an arts group with lots of independent contractors would not necessarily, well, um, that would not necessarily take you over the 500 because they don't count for this purpose, nor do employees outside of the United States. This law went into effect just uh, last week, uh, six days ago, and the law itself expires December 31st. Next slide, please. But in defining that fewer than 500, employers 500 and more, this law does not apply to them. Presumably, they have paid leave, they have better provisions for employees, so Congress did not legislate in that area. But there are exceptions in this category of fewer than 500. Exceptions I have in quotes for a reason. Both of those are exceptions at the decision, the judgment of the employer. Healthcare providers and emergency medical technicians are exempted or accepted from the mandate if the employer so chooses. It's not the way we use the Congress usually writes laws, but a uh, health provider or EMT, the employer may elect to exclude them from the application of the act. Re rationale, I think, is that these are people on the front lines. If they're taking family leave off for 10 weeks, and those people, if they are, they're taken out of the action for the 10, most critical 10 weeks. I'm thinking that's the rationale. I was not in the room when they wrote it. Question of who is a healthcare provider. We received several questions from you. We appreciate that in advance. Who is this healthcare provider? Certainly nurses and doctors and orderlies. Uh, but it also applies to most people working in community health clinics and nursing homes. It can apply to the dietitian if the employer so chooses. I cannot tell you definitively, does it mean all staff or can it mean all staff in a residential facility for, say, individuals with disabilities or something like that? It's a debatable point. I just don't have this, a straight answer to that. Sorry for that. It also, uh, there's also a quote unquote exception or exemption for employers with fewer than, five, than 50 employees. The employer has to claim it. The employer has to prove it. So uh, the, the law requires the employer to convince the Department of Labor that uh, allowing employees paid sick leave or paid uh, family leave would je quote, jeopardize the viability of the business, close quote, going forward. That's a very tough standard. The Department of Labor has put out regulations in this area uh, or guidance in this area. And I'll say here, and I'll probably say, that, say it on just about every slide, the guidance is changing quickly. Uh, Tell mentioned that we talked, we did a, this talk or something like this talk last week, and then the Department of Labor and the Department of Treasury and SBA come out with several iterations of the rules. So the rules are a changing. They're doing the best they can to catch up. Remember, these laws are less than a month old. One of them is less than 10 days old. 
So that's the rules on who this applies to in terms of what employer and employer size. Next slide, please. The key, there's two types of leave. There's emergency paid sick leave, that's for two weeks. And then a little later, I will talk about emergency family leave. This is the uh, emergency paid sick leave. There's two types of this for the first two weeks. There's employee leave, an employee who cannot work or cannot telework due to quarantine or isolation order, advice, advice of a medical prefer, professional to self-quarantine or is experiencing symptoms of uh, this dreaded uh, virus, this dreaded disease, is entitled to two weeks of paid sick leave. And um, my paid, paid sick leave at regular rate of pay up to $511 a day. There may be a rational basis for that number. I don't know it. It's 80 hours. It's 10 days, 10 eight-hour days. So the maximum of the paid sick leave, the two weeks, the 10 days of paid sick leave, is $5,110 over the paid sick leave period. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There's been some change, as I mentioned, as I will be mentioning frequently, I think. The rules keep changing. Late last week, the Department of Labor issued guidance. That's the link to it. All of these links and slides and recording will be made available to you afterwards, so you don't need to write that down. The Department of Labor put out regulations defining the, qu the qu quarantine or isolation order. Prior to that link being live, every expert pr uh, presumed that you're ordered quarantine by a doctor or, the, or a local government uh, ordered quarantine for certain individuals. So if quarantine is if it's by the federal, state, or local government for quarantine or isolation order, then this would apply. The Department of Labor came out last week and said, and that applies to government orders. And I'm sitting in Virginia talking to you. My governor has said we should all, we're all ordered to stay at home until June 10th. According to the Department of Labor's uh, interpretation, that means that if I, I am teleworking now, so it doesn't apply, but if you can't work or telework, that automatically triggers the sick leave provision. Uh, surprised a lot of people, and there are some caveats to that, so it's not quite as broad. I hope I didn't lose people as I was uh, working through that. The caveats to that are that even though most people in the country may be subject to the, a quarantine order or an isolation stay-at-home order, uh, if you can telework, it does not apply, as I'm doing right now as I talk to you. It also does not apply, as I'll show you in, the, in another slide, that if the employer is shut down, if there's not a workplace to go to, then the sick leave provision does not apply. The idea being that you can't be sick from a job that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, perhaps good news, the, anyone who is shut out of work and laid off as a result can probably claim unemployment insurance, which we will talk about. My colleague, Tiffany Gordon Carter, will talk about toward the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. So I was talking about employee leave of two weeks. Also within the two weeks of emergency sick leave is an, a family leave provision. If you can't, if a family member can't work or telework, the or telework is vital. Um, if you cannot telework, and uh, then you're entitled to paid family sick leave. If you are caring for a sick individual, person who's quarantined because of the virus, or you're caring for a child due to school or child care or child center closure, or your child care provider is not available, you're entitled to two weeks or 10 days of your regular rate of pay up to $200 a day or $2,000 over the entire two week period. Next slide, please. So I was talking about sick leave. Now I'm switching to talk about emergency family and medical leave. Notice the, the criteria are caring for a child because of school or child care center closure, uh, 
it does not apply, the emergency family leave does not apply to caring for a quarantined individual. Don't know why, but uh, taking care of a sick family member no longer generates the paid sick leave because the two out to two weeks have expired. And it also does not apply to the family leave. Just the way it is. Same two thirds pay up to $200 a day applies there. Next slide, please. For people who are on paid leave, they are entitled to job protections. You can't be fired, you can't be discriminated against for taking the leave. That leave does not apply if there's, or that protection does not apply if the uh, employer uh, shuts down, shuts down the workforce. We hear about the 6.6 .6 million people who applied last week for unemployment insurance. Their job, their workplaces were shut down. So, as I said before, if you're taking sick leave or you're entitled to sick leave, but the job is not available now, then the sick leave uh, mandate, sick leave opportunity, is not for the family leave, does not apply. Again, employees are likely to be eligible for unemployment insurance, and they've improved the rules so the burden will be less harsh than in a regular recession. Those are the those links there to the two sets of guidance from the Department of Labor. If you're an employer, you, you're operational, you're working through this. Those are the two best sources for your uh, for your identification. Next slide, please. Okay, the this is Tiffany. Do you have some questions um, before we move on to uh, payroll taxes? I was wondering if we could cover some of these questions about paid leave requirements. Mm -hmm. Could we go back a slide real quick? And um, David, also, there's been a couple of comments. You sound a little fuzzy. If you could speak into your uh, mic a little bit, a little bit closer, that'd be better. Uh, so some of these specific questions about paid leave and kind of the definitions and what qualifies and what and who doesn't. So first up, are mental health clinicians and direct care workers at behavioral behavioral health agencies considered health care providers? That would be, I was alluding to something like that earlier. That would be on the borderline, and I would they probably would be subject to the employer's option of declaring those people essential and not so not eligible for the unemployment insurance. It's a debatable point. If I were the employee, I would certainly debate it. So there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A about specific types of workers, um, just like you were saying, who are you know identified by title or classification. So is what your answer is, it depends on the governor and it is debatable by the employee. Is that what you would tell someone? Well, what's, de what's dependent on the governor is whether the governor has declared a stay at home order or a quarantine in place or shut down businesses. The, in, the interpretation of job duties, the two issue, the two job duties exempted or exemptable under the statute are healthcare providers and emergency personnel. So police, uh, emergency medical technicians are the obvious ones. Uh, nonprofits who go in to save lives of homeless people don't fit into that category, although they are heroes, uh, but that would not, so they would still be eligible for the paid leave. The employer would not have the option of uh, excluding those employees. It's uh, people who are necessary for the operation of the, uh, the giving of health support. Okay, so maybe this will clarify that even further. Our governor has ordered all non-essential business closed due to COVID-19. Does that count as a state-ordered quarantine for the purposes of paid leave? Does my nonprofit have to pay all staff paid six leave? According to the Department of Labor that's bottom on the screen here, it seems, it's hard to believe, but yes. That is, that is what the Department of Labor said in that link uh, dated April 1st. 
there was talk of the Department of Labor pulling that guidance, pulling back from it. I checked right before we started and it's still on their website. Uh, I share the surprise of the person who was typing it, but um, that seems to be how they're interpreting it. Okay. Are employers mandated to continue paying employees their full wages even if they are unable to work or can only work a portion of their scheduled hours from home due to office closing? That's a, that, that question could be raised on uh, several of the provisions that we're going to be talking about. If they are sick or family leave, oh, if the office is shut down and the, the job is not something you can do by telework, then the leave provisions do not apply. That's the work, clo work closure of work site cancels paid leave requirement. That's on the screen right there. If you can telework, then the leave would still be applicable. Mm, yes, if you could telework, then the leave would still apply. There was a question about the $511 amount. So I know that you said that, um, you know, we don't quite know why they came up with that exact number, but what if that amount is less than what the employee earns daily anyway? Can the nonprofit pay the rest um, plus up the, the amount of paid leave? That is a fantastic question, and it sounds like a nonprofit person who cares about employees. Thanks for asking that, whoever typed that in. Um, Yes, the employer can plus up, can pay more than 511. The employer can pay that money out of any paid leave provision that the employer has. The exception or the, the, the but is that I'm gonna, when we finish these questions, we're gonna go to the paid leave uh, tax credit and you can only get a refundable tax credit up to the $511 a day. If you pay 600 a day, you can still only get 511 credit for the paid leave provision. Okay. And that might be a good time to change to that section. There were a lot of questions about the 50 employee cap and that number. So just for clarification, someone did I hear that all nonprofits with fewer than 50 employees are exempt from the paid leave provision? No. Well, you, know, you may have heard it, I may have said it, but, it, but it's not true. The under 50 provision is an employer that employs fewer than 50 people can claim that giving people, allowing people to take leave, to take paid sick leave or pay or pay, allow people to take paid family leave would, I don't know what were the words I used, um, would jeopardize the existence of the organization, I think is what it said. Um, and it's a very high standard as to what the employer has to make the case, the employer has to say no, and then make the case in the Department of Labor when the employee complains. And in these times, especially with lots of shutdown, we really don't expect that to happen that way. But there's no blanket. If you're, if you're smaller than 50, you don't have to worry about this. Um, or you as an employee don't get any, don't have any rights. Instead, it's the employer has a heavy burden to show that providing leave would undermine the existence of the organization, of the, of the nonprofit board of business. Okay. And a lot of questions in the Q&A that, uh, ask about this paid leave provision under the FFCRA compared to other paid leave benefits that the nonprofit employer already provides. So um, can taking the emergency FMLA render an employee ineligible for other state family leave? I, I know New York has a fa paid family leave provision. Um, this one probably is more generous, so it would override the state. I think, I think New York just passed a one week paid leave. The statute is written that you're only entitled to two, an employee is only entitled to two weeks of paid sick leave. So those, that's the only mandate requirement. The employer can provide two, four, eight, 
however many the employer wants to provide, but there's not a requirement. And if the employer provides two weeks of paid sick leave for this reason on the employer system, you can't then add two more weeks under the statute. The statute only allows two, two weeks of paid sick leave, whether it's following the federal rule or something better under the federal, under the, the employee plan. Okay. I know that we have a lot more to get through. Um, we've already had on the 600 questions, so I want to get through as many as possible. Um, one more, two more on this section, and then I'll let you get back to it, and we can come back to some of these paid leave questions. Does the paid leave um, due to COVID have to be taken continuously? It has to be paid what? Taken? Taken continuously. Great question. No, intermittent leave is allowed. And uh, if you go back to that, the, the slide before, the link uh, answers specific questions about intermittent leave. What's particularly beneficial is that the Department of Labor has loosened, has completely changed its interpretation of telework. It used to be telework to the Department of Labor meant you know, log on at eight o'clock in the morning and you log off at four o'clock, it's eight hours straight. They're now acknowledging that people are home with kids, they're working for a couple of hours, they're going off for a while, they're taking intermittent leave. The uh, Department of Labor encourages employers and employees to work out something reasonable, but yes, you can do intermittent leave. Yes, you can alternate with your, uh, with your partner in terms of going into work and someone stays home. We have that in our organization. Of when when you're working or when you're not, so that uh, the whole point of the law is to help people cope with this. So intermittent leave is something that uh, is limited to the two week, eighty hours of sick leave, uh, eight hundred, no, four, ten weeks, <laughs> eight hours so, uh, of week um, of family leave. Can't do math on the fly. Um, but you can do four hours a day, two hours and two hours a day, things like that. Okay, and so this might clarify that a little bit further. Do employees have to exhaust all vacation before taking the FMLA? No. No. Okay. So um, last question. Are you required to request a credit through FFCRA first if you plan on requesting a loan through the Paycheck Protection Program? So this is getting into the PPP. Maybe I'll wait no, no, and you can that. do both. You can do both. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. I'll turn it back over to you, but we'll have more questions. <laughs> I want everyone listening to know that Tiffany's on your side and trying to throw curveballs and tough questions at me. Good job, Tiffany. Uh, the other half of the paid leave, clearly a lot of questions about it. Clearly, there's a lot of interest in how do we properly uh, uh, implement that. The other half is the refundable payroll tax credit. You hear the word tax credit. You as a nonprofit hear the word tax credit. Your back usually gets up because typically Congress does not remember that nonprofits are 10% of the workforce. There were more than 5% of gross domestic product, that we are awesome. They did this time. This is this refundable payroll tax credit is a huge win for the nonprofit community because we've been telling them for years, if you're doing anything to support or promote employment, you've got to use a payroll tax credit because nonprofits don't pay income taxes. Well, we invented the idea, we the nonprofit community invented that, the idea, and Congress liked it so much they have, they're now applying it to all businesses under this law. Every employer who pays sick leave, paid sick leave, paid family leave, is entitled to uh, claim this refundable payroll tax credit. It applies to the employer's share of payroll taxes. If your employer, you, you're aware of that. And it's refundable in that if the leave costs, let's say you paid $5,110 for two weeks of pay for an employee and your total payroll taxes due for, a, for that quarter is only $4,000, you paid $5,110 and $4,000, you will get a check back from the treasury 
for a thousand. Uh, well, I have my math work again. <laughs> 1110. Uh, in that it's refundable. If you don't use up all of the credit, you'll get the money back from the IRS. You do this on the usual payroll tax quarterly tax form you use. That's IRS form 941. That's a picture of it right there. Next slide, please. And there's been an update. And the IRS issued frequently asked questions addressing a lot of tough questions on April 1st. And they announced the creation of a new IRS form 7200. Lots of employers, nonprofits, and for-profits have complained that I can't wait till the end of the quarter. I'm paying payroll, I'm paying paid sick leave, paid family leave, and I know at the end of the quarter I can get a check back, but I need the money now. So this new form 7200 allows you to identify what your sick leave costs are, fill out the form, send it to Treasury, and assuming the process works, they will send you a check immediately. Haven't seen it in, in, in action yet. It's a good idea. We hope that it works. And it's an effort by Treasury to address that problem of you can't wait. We can't wait until the end of, uh, in, uh, uh, until the end of a quarter to get this payment. So that's some progress. And that's... Uh, the, the goal of the legislation. Now, I think we're, we're at the end of the Families First Act. Do you have more about the tax credit, Tiffany? Um, let's keep a lot of these questions are asking the, the, how the PPP plays in with the tax credit. Okay, so move on. Okay. The next big law enacted March 27th, and I'm wondering, um, Tim Delaney, do you want to talk about some background on this? Sure, just wanted to make sure everybody was aware this is the second big bill, and it is um, one that, in terms of nonprofits, uh, there are provisions in here on loans for nonprofits, uh, above the line uh, deduction for charitable contributions, employee retention tax credit, the payroll tax deferral, unemployment insurance provisions, and student loans. So uh, David will be covering a lot of this. The overview is uh, the bill itself pushed out about $2.2 trillion it was approved unanimously. There were some shenanigans in the House, but eventually it did pass uh, without a, any votes in opposition, both the, the um, Senate and the House, and it was signed into law uh, a week ago uh, Friday. Um, and, and so uh, this is something that because nonprofits came together um, and because nonprofits have noticed in the past that um, Congress and state legislatures often forget about nonprofits, even though we're the third largest employer, we get left out. And so we rallied together and used our voices. We need to be advocating. It was effective this time. Did we get everything we wanted? No, that's why we're gonna be continuing in the next provisions in phase four, in phase five, and at the state level. But, uh, we can uh, sit back uh, and uh, rejoice as best you can in, in these awful circumstances and say, Congress included us this time. There is relief. Next slide. Now, uh, the things that I just uh, mentioned on the previous slide are of sector-wide uh, significance, uh, meaning that whatever subsector your um, nonprofit is operating in, um, there are going to be advantages for you in uh, everything that we're going to go over in more detail. If you're in some subsectors, such as for cultural institutions or in education or for hospitals, uh, there are uh, yet additional provisions in the CARES Act that might benefit your organization. 
we are not here to look in and dive deep in all those different uh, nooks and crannies. We're here on a sector-wide basis uh, looking at what all nonprofits should be able to tap into. Next slide. And here's where I almost turn things back to David. I want to address one of the questions that came in, which is on our website, do we say whether a document has been updated or not? Um, the way we do that is we actually update the document itself, and we will then put on the document the date that it was uh, last updated. And so you will be able to see that um, as we're updating. And so when you see one that was dated uh, March 27th, you may have printed that out. Make sure that you come back and look. You might find that it was updated on April 2nd or uh, we actually updated um, a couple on Sunday, uh, and then there was another um, some FAQs that came out yesterday. And so, all that we can to make sure you get the latest information. We are updating, and we will post it on the document so you're aware that that is the latest that's out there. So, with that, David, here's the baton back to you. Thank you, sir. And. The rain on the, on the tin roof above me has gotten louder. I'll lean closer and uh, if any interrupt, if I need to shout even louder. Okay, David, um, you don't need to shout louder. You're doing great. But I did get a few questions in tandem as we were switching over. So I wanted to go back real quick to payroll tax credits just to cover a couple quick ones. Uh, first up, is there a maximum credit on the payroll tax credit? David? Well, I'm, I'm pausing, pausing oh. and thinking. Not one in the statute. Okay. And then um, what is, what are qualified wages under it? It would be um, regular, regular wages, full-time wages would be for the wages for a 40 hour work week or salary for the uh, for the two week period. If someone regularly works overtime, then it's the employee's work history. If someone always works 50 hours a week, then it, that would count in as well. That, um, as well as the share of the employee's uh, health benefits that the employer pays. <laughs> What was the first date that falls within the tax credit? Uh, one of the organization's staff members fell sick before the emergency legislation passed. April 1st, before it passed. The yes. employee, that employee is not entitled to paid sick leave under the statute. This is not retroactive. Uh, April 1st was the first day, the effective date of the statute. Okay. And leave before then does not um, does not trigger the statute. So the some of these questions the deal with the uh, time frames. Since you're just covering that right now, we're already past two weeks. Um, I guess we're not past two weeks on the April first. But if we're looking forward, what what do you think is going to happen with that? Um, just being outside of this two week time frame. Well, it's not, it's when the person either gets sick or has to take the leave. So someone could be told right now they have their, they test positive and have to stay at home. So it'd be the two week period that start then. I may not be understanding the question. Okay. And is the amount being paid out as sick leave, is that taxable? Yes, it's income. And Treasury has said that the refundable uh, relief here and in several things I'm going to talk about is taxable to the employer also. But that's something to be resolved April 15th next year. The refundable money uh, is treated as taxable income to the employer. Okay. I'm going to turn it back over to you to Hart. Thanks for uh, letting me break in again. Okay. Again, 
folks, she's on your side. Um, this slide we think is the most downloaded one we've done. It's also one of the most revised documents we've done. Tim mentioned that on the second page of this at the bottom will be the most recent date online. This is the most recent date is two days ago, Sunday, when we revised it. They keep changing things. And just, I, don't, I hope I'm not complaining, but just on this document, the interest rate for the Paycheck Protection Program over the course of three days went from 4% to 0.5% to 1%. It's a moving target. Next slide, please. Those are the three loan programs on the, on the chart. Uh, and there are three main programs for securing financing under the CARES Act. There's the Paycheck Prote Protection Program. That's the big one. There's the Emergency Economic Injury Dis um, Disaster Loan Program. That's one that's been around a while with some modifications. And then there's a new mid-sized business loan program for larger nonprofits and other employers. It's not as well defined yet, but it's there and provides some hope. Next slide, please. The Paycheck Protection Program. This is the small business loan program. It used to be, or the, the underlying part of this is the old SBA 7A loans. Historically, nonprofits cannot participate in it. We don't know much about it because we have not been considered worthy. We are now, but the Small Business Administration is having trouble and there are hiccups in the process as they adjust the whole system to apply to us also. Let me give you the overview and then we'll dig into details. Notice those asterisks by the details. Things are changing or there are different interpretations, or there could be legislation down the road. Uh, let me go through the big picture first, and then I'll back up on some uh, key details that I know many of you care about. Who's eligible? Employers with 500 or fewer employees. 501c3 charitable nonprofits are expressly covered by this. Charitable nonprofits, small 500 or fewer, are entitled to participate in this program. The, uh, and I'll come back to it, but that includes churches and synagogues and mosques. That includes religious organizations. That took a little extra analysis by the administration, but all 501c3 organizations are covered are eligible to participate in this program 500 or fewer. You don't have to have a um, IRS form 1024. You don't have to have a determination letter from the IRS. Most churches do not. If you're a 501c, if you're a church, you're automatically 501c3. I'm using church generically. Uh, so you're in. Welcome. The loan amount, how much you can borrow, is two and a half times your monthly payroll. Monthly payroll is a math problem that I am not going to try to do on the fly, but it means what are your, your usual, it's the average, well, the way to calculate it, you take the normal way is you take all of your payroll for 2019, January 1st to December 31st. You subtract employees who aren't working in the United States. You subtract the amount of pay over $100,000. So that they only pay up to, you can only get the loan for a share of the payroll up to $100,000 per person. You divide by 12, uh, you also subtract the employer share of employment taxes. You divide by 12 to get your monthly average, and then you multiply that by two and a half times. So if your payroll with those subtractions equals uh, $1.2 million, then your monthly is $100,000, so $250,000 is your loan amount. For most of you, most of us, it's going to be much smaller. For my church, the loan amount is about $21,000. Uh, that's preacher and staff. The, what you can use the loan for, you can use it for 
paying payroll and paying benefits. Benefits include health insurance, vacation, uh, retirement, uh, say vacation. It also applies to rent and mortgage and debt payments and utilities. So you can use the money for all of those things. Um, you, how do you apply? You apply at a local bank. The asterisk is there to say, at the beginning of this process, when they enacted the law on March 27th, the statement was all 1,800 SBA approved lending institutions are automatically in this process, in this program. And Secretary Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, said that he's trying to get it so that all FDIC insured banks and all insured credit unions also participate in this program. Their goal was to make it to ensure that as many financial institutions as possible, many, as many storefronts as possible were accepting loans to get money into the hands of small businesses and nonprofits. And you can apply, the application started last Friday, sort of, and you can apply through June 30th. So let's go to the next slide, please and we will address more questions. So I wanna re-emphasize this point, the who is eligible 500 or fewer. The Small Business Administration late on Friday night issued guidance. You can see down the lower left-hand corner, the faith-based organization frequently asked questions. That's regarding this Paycheck Protection Program called PPP. And the next one I'm going to talk about, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program called EIDL. This guidance expressed very clearly that faith-based uh, organizations uh, are eligible for the program. It also re relates to a question of affiliation. In counting the 500 or fewer employees for all, all nonprofits, uh, there's an affiliation requirement, meaning there are regulations that say if a group of nonprofits are part of the same affiliated organization, then they will, uh, they will count all, all of the employees toward the same you know, to determine whether there are 500 or fewer based on whether the parent organization exercises control. So if you imagine a a national nonprofit that has local affiliates, five or 10 employees per state, you have to, and, the, and the national tells them what to do, Red Cross is that way. Then uh, that's affiliated, they're more than 500 employees, they are not eligible. The, the frequently asked questions, the guidance that came out last Friday made an exception for that rule for faith-based organizations. They did it based on religious freedom, interpretation of religious freedom statute and the constitution. Specifically, they say that for faith-based organizations that are affiliated, like a denomination, if the prime affiliation is based on religious beliefs, then the affiliation rule does not apply. Meaning, my down the street Methodist church uh, is its own freestanding entity. It is not treated as part of the Virginia Conference or part of the International Methodist Church because we're affiliated by, uh, by religious beliefs, not we're all sharing a, uh, we're all selling cookies or selling uh, a product type of thing. If there's a commercial affiliation, then the religious, the faith-based exception does not apply. Hopefully I've been clear. The, this is, nonprofits have to follow the affiliation rule of if there's control and more than 500 employees, we can't participate in the Paycheck Protection Program. But an exception to the exception is for faith-based organizations bound by religious belief, which is, I um, think, most denominations and faiths. Next slide, please. These are the forms. They've changed several times as well. It's an application form. I've already uh, discussed a uh, uh, little bit of the process. On there, the size is too small. 
But here you calculate what your monthly is, you, you know, two and a half times monthly amount, you tell your number of employees. There are a number of questions on there. And one of them is ownership. Well, we're nonprofits. We're not owned by individuals, we're owned by the public. The advice we're hearing from multiple CPAs and some banks is you can leave it blank. You can type not, you can write in not applicable in A, or you can write in nonprofit. This is an example where the SBA is not used to working with nonprofits. So when they wrote the form, they were still thinking about small business. On the online drop down form, there is a box for nonprofit but they still have the ownership question. It's a recurring problem. We're still working with Small Business Administration to try to make this form and make this process more nonprofit friendly. They also ask questions about, uh, there are also verifications where you need to verify or certify that the loan is necessary to support ongoing operations of your organization. That means so that you can keep paying employees. The funds are going to be used to retain workers, I'm reading from a list here, and maintain payroll, or make mortgage payments, lease payments, utilities payments. You have to certify, you have to, you have to certify that you're using it for the purpose of the statute. Uh, ultimately, you will need, ultimately, not when you're applying, uh, but ultimately you'll need documentation to verify the number of full-time equivalent employees on your payroll so that they can calculate, did you... Um, have, did you use this to pay employees to earn the forgiveness? Which is the next topic. Next slide, please. The interesting thing or the valuable thing about this Paycheck Protection Program is loan forgiveness. This loan can essentially be turned into a grant if you get the loan and you do certain things. If you use the loan, uh, and maintain your employment for the eight weeks after the beginning and after you get the money, you'll get the loan forgiven in, in total. If you get the loan and you rehire people who have been laid off, rehire them by June 30, then you can get loan forgiveness. So you may not spend all the money, uh, and so only the amount you paid on payroll will be uh, subject to loan forgiveness. But if you rehire people, then loan forgiveness does kick in. There was a lot of consternation early on that nonprofits have already laid people off. So are we disqualified? No, we're not disqualified. So con getting into the head of Congress is a good idea sometimes, like this one. The idea behind this provision and all of these was people are being laid off, people are going to be laid off. Congress wants to encourage employers to pay people, pay people even, even if they're not working, to pay people so they have money so they can pay their bills to reduce the suffering. So if you've already laid off people because Congress didn't get the law passed in time, Congress doesn't think that's your fault, you can rehire and you can, and you can trigger the loan forgiveness provisions. We think that's important. New guidance that's come out now says that they're only going to uh, forgive, you have to use at least 75% of the loan for payroll. And you can only get, you can, you can spend more, you can do 100% on payroll and that's fine. And they're only going to forgive up to 25% of the loan paying for rent and utilities and such. That is not in the statute. Small Business Administration made that determination. Presume it's legal, but it's based on the lack of funds, that it's limited resources. They want to get as much money out to pay payroll. So they're promoting, they're promoting payroll through, they're promoting giving, um, hiring people through this program. Utilities are important, but people are more important in their minds. Next slide, please. A re reiteration of what I said that, again, in whole, in whole or in part, if you maintain employment or rehire people. Uh, you need to rehire people by June 30th. Loans are now available. Uh, they opened up on June 3rd from 
I'm sorry, April 3rd. There have been a lot of challenges. Some banks, from what we understand, some banks are saying we're not taking nonprofit applications. Others are saying we're only taking applications from customers that we have a lending relationship with. Some are saying we prefer nonprofits, come on in. Wish I had a list of those to share with everyone. I don't. The, the main point is that this is new. The administration and Congress are scrambling to make it work. It's not pretty, but there's slow progress along the way. Something that Tim Delaney mentioned at the top is that the word is Congress will be trying to put $250 billion more into this program. They initially appropriated about $350 billion and they're afraid the money's gonna run out very quickly. So hopefully by the end of this week, they will have appropriated another $250 billion, which will make it $600 billion for this program. And that sh doesn't, necessarily, doesn't necessarily speed up the processing for nonprofits, but it does make it more likely that eligible nonprofits will get money eventually. And if you use the money the way they want, then uh, you can get that loan forgiven. David, this is okay. David. This is Tiffany. We've had a lot of questions. We've had a lot of questions in the chat box about they've some nonprofits have already heard that their banks have hit their loan limits or the money has run out for their certain banks. Um, what would you recommend to those nonprofits who've already heard that? Well, if an answer is just nag the, the nag them to, to into submission. The better answer is Congress has heard that too, and they're going to appropriate more money. It also has to do with the bank being very conservative and uh, being sometimes being they're, they're being slow with, with dealing with a lot of the people we're talking to, but they are hitting that number fast. We're concerned that they're giving the loans to the larger for-profit businesses that they know and favor. So there's some investigations to go there. More money coming is the best answer. But we're gonna run out of time. Uh, let's try to get those, um, perhaps you can keep an eye on those as we move on. So we need to get through the other loans and some other items, but I'll try to pick up the pace. Thank you. There's the emergency EIDL program. As I said, there's the normal one that's been around a long time. That's one that nonprofits could participate in. And then there's the emergency grant or advanced program. It's the middle column on that chart you see in front of you. Next slide, please. The normal one says private nonprofits. That's what the old law said. And historically, there's a but, historically, the Small Business Administration interpreted that to mean most charitable nonprofits, but not houses of worship. That has changed. Remember the Small Business Administration frequently asked questions that I showed earlier that came out last Friday. That rule, that determination overrides past interpretations by the Small Business Administration. So nonprofits, so, uh, Houses of worship and non um, houses of worship can participate fully in the program now, as interpreted by the new interpretation. The loan amount on the screen here it says up to two million dollars. That's what the law says. We've got some very disturbing news today. Shortly before we started this program, that the Small Business Administration is now saying that they will only grant EIDL loans of up to twenty-five thousand dollars. That is $15,000 for operational expenses and $10,000 for the next thing I'm gonna talk about. $25,000 instead of 2 million suggests that there's a serious problem here. The people I've talked to shortly before this uh, webinar said that they don't understand, they doubt the legal authority. So there's some explaining that's gonna be needed. If there are any congressional staffers on this call, would you please take a note and follow up and call the SBA to find out what they're doing and what needs to be done to fix that. That was not intended in my program, but we just learned this. For this loan you apply, and for, for the EIDL loan you apply with the Small Business Administration online, 
And this program is available through December 31st. Next slide, please. The key provisions, that, that second check is uh, irrelevant if they're only doing 25,000, but it's only based on your credit score and the, the applicant's credit score. There used to be a whole lot of paperwork and a whole lot of hoops to jump through, and those were erased for this program through the end of the year. There is no loan forgiveness in this normal EIDL proposed uh, provision. Next slide. The next one is the one you've heard about. It's the emergency advance. Congress said nonprofit, or nonprofits and for-profits need money now. We're going to create a loan advance. It's actually a grant. You apply for it, you get $10,000 in three days. And even if you don't get the grant, or even if you don't get the EIDL loan, you get to keep the $10,000 treated as a grant. Like the SBA, like the other one, you apply on this, the form for the Small Business Administration, and it's available through the end of this, of this year. Next slide, it's, um, there, there's where you apply online. If you just go to sba.gov, easy to find how to get there. Disturbing though that it's been trimmed down. Now I mentioned that uh, religious institutions, faith-based organizations are eligible. In this case, the SBA actually fixed their, their online form. Uh, this is what it says on there, applicable nonprofits, um, with a letter ruling, or faith-based organizations. So uh, Small Business Administration added that piece. Yes, you can, is the, the answer there. It's abundantly clear. Next slide, please. I'm moving on now to the third one. I'm going to be quick on this because loan amounts unclear and how to apply is unclear. Congress created this as they were building out the $500 billion loan program for Boeing and for the airlines and for the uh, cruise ships and so forth. They also included a provision for mid-sized businesses, including, uh, including nonprofits, all of you on this, most of you on this call. Mid-size to them is 500 to 10,000 employees. Loan amounts unclear. The purpose is to retain 90% of your staff. Some questions about when, timing issues. And it's available through December 31st. The Secretary of Treasury has said that he wants to get that going soon, but uh, he will endeavor, the statute says the Secretary will endeavor to seek the impl implementation of a program that's some pretty soft language, but he has said that he wants to uh, create it soon. It could well be that the program details are made, made uh, public this month, April. Uh, advocacy is definitely needed. There's an advocacy effort underway as I speak, and people are signing on to a letter and so forth. Perhaps we'll share more information on that uh, a little bit later. Next slide, please. So I'll go quickly through the next slide so that we'll have some time for questions. We can come back to the loan programs. Giving incentives. Hopefully you've heard this. The law created an above the line deduction that's sometimes called a universal deduction or a non-itemizer deduction. It is available to all taxpayers, not just those who itemize. So someone, most 90% of taxpayers now take the standard deduction. They are, will, for 2020, under the statute, be able to take a $300 donation deduction off their 2020 taxes. The numbers, the $300 is too small. It ought to apply to 2019 retroactively so that we could be generating revenue right now immediately. But that's what it is for now, and it's improvement on what we had before. So we're worthy of celebration. The statute also lifted the, the cap on how much individuals can donate and itemize in a year. Individuals can now donate all of their tax, the equivalent of all of their taxable income in a year to charitable nonprofits in 2020 and deduct it. The current cap is you can only do that up to 60%. So that's an increase. So more wealthy people can give more money and help fill the holes in nonprofit budgets faster. So that's some good news, but that's only for those who itemize, only about 10% of the workforce. 
You know, the law also allows corporations to donate 25% of their taxable income. That's up from 10%, and it allows corporations to donate 20% of their taxable income in food donations. Those of you who are food banks, those of you who can utilize food donations, uh, should be telling your corporate partners that they can they can give more and encourage them to do so because this is a time this is a desperate time. Next slide, please. As I said, I'm going quickly. Tax credits. The, there's something called the Employee Retention Tax Credit. It is another refundable payroll tax credit, just like we talked about for the paid leave provision, the refundable tax credit. In the, uh, businesses, including nonprofits, can get a tax credit of up to $5,000 per person. It's a 50% tax credit based on salaries of uh, up, up to the first $10,000. The whole point is you pay your staff whether or not they are working. And the uh, and you can get the credit, apply it to the payroll taxes that you would ordinarily pay. You have to be an ongoing, you had to have been an ongoing concern at the beginning of this year, experienced a whole a partial shutdown, or saw a drop in revenue of at least 50% in the first quarter of 2020 compared to the first quarter of 2019. Next slide, please. Tax exempt organizations need to apply when it comes to the partial, the shutdown, it has to do with your whole operation. So if you're spread out all over the country and only one state were shut down, then this would not necessarily apply to you. But um, and these rules have not been fully clarified. But it applies to nonprofits under certain circumstances. Do note, you cannot use this employee retention tax credit if you are ever see, are receiving a payroll protection program loans. The reason is if you're paying, if you're getting essentially free money to pay people, you can't also get a uh, tax, a fundable tax credit for paying them. Makes sense. And this is the form you use to get that refundable tax credit, the brand new as of March, 2020 form uh, 7,200. Next slide, please. Next topic is tax deferral. Uh, if you still have payroll taxes due because you haven't, because of, uh, for whatever reason, you still owe payroll taxes, you can defer the lay payment of your employer portion of the payroll taxes in 2020. You don't have to pay uh, uh, until First half is 2021, and that's a typo. The second half is 2022. So you can defer paying your payroll taxes for this year. You cannot do this, though. You can't take this if you also get a Paycheck Protection Act PPP loan. Next slide, please. Tiffany, can you carry us through these? Sure, David. Um things, unemployment insurance, this is uh, kind of a blend between state and federal policy and law um, that the CARES Act applies to. So uh, there is some, some relief for individuals. So waiting periods have been waived, um, extended to 13 weeks. There is a $600 a week benefit. This has been a question that I've seen a lot in the Q&A. Nonprofits are not Cover, do not have to cover this. This is covered under the Federal CARES Act and it will be paid by the federal government. Um, but that just provides additional, uh, additional funding for individuals. And uh, there is clarity that church employees specifically are covered under the un unemployment insurance provisions. Uh, for employers, most employers are held harmless. Um, the only caveat that nonprofits uh, are worried about and very concerned about for good reason is if they are self-insured, there is a provision that only 50% of that is covered. And so that is something that we're looking forward to um, advocating to change in hopefully phase four, but that is as of right now, if you're self-insured, only 50% are covered. There is some movement in the states to change this as, as well or to have the states cover the other 50%, but that varies by state. Um, next slide. So student loans. This has been a change since last week. Forbearance. Uh, all federal loans, this is 
federal only. So if you have private loans, if you have things like uh, consolidation, uh, it does not apply to you. But if you have federal, uh, for, you are automatically placed into forbearance. You don't need to talk to provider anymore. And those non-payments during forbearance qualify for the PSLF, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness, so long as you are still employed by a qualifying employer, which includes governments and 501c3 nonprofits. Other nonprofits do qualify, but that is specific to the type of work you're doing. And if you are a, are a congressional staffer, this all also qualify, you also qualify. Um, something else that's automatic, all interest rates have been dropped to 0% for federal loans. That's automatic. You can see that on your Fed Loan Servicing page already. And um, all wage garnishment and debt collections have been stopped. That goes through, um, that's just 60 days since March 13th, but we wouldn't be surprised if that is extended as well, just like the forbearance and interest rates were. Next slide, please. And a um, couple other things here, other actions that uh, different agencies have taken so far. Uh, we know that the tax filing deadlines have been delayed, but that doesn't apply to nonprofits. So that's something that we're looking into. And then the Office of Management and budget has created some more flexibility for uh, federal funds and grants um, for nonprofits and uh, you know, other contracts and grants, but they have uh, waived some various timelines and uh, requirements and measurements. So, or they have at least announced that they're, they're pushing for that. So hopefully that provides better funding and a more streamlined approach for nonprofits. Next slide. And uh, we just want to do one more plug. The census is underway. Please fill out your form online by phone or via quest a paper questionnaire. It opened up last week. I think about 52% of, um, or less than 50% of uh, households have filled out the census. And so please do that. It reduces burdens on nonprofits and governments. The deadline has been extended, but the faster you fill it out, the less burden there is on government workers and nonprofits getting out the count. Next slide. And so we're gonna... before you go, Tiffany, I, as you're looking at the list and getting ready to fire them at me, let me answer two quick questions. Yep. Two very valuable, vital questions. One is, can we take EIDL, can we take the emergency, the economic injury loan and the PPP? Can we apply for both? Yes, you can apply for both. You cannot take both for the same expenses. So if you are asking for the money to pay for your mortgage and you're taking uh, under the EIDL and you're asking for it under the Paycheck Protection Program to pay your mortgage, you, break, you, you broke the rules. You cannot do it for the same expenses. But the loan, the grant, the advance, the $10,000 thing, SBA and Congress intended that, yes, you can apply for EIDL to get the emergency $10,000 and that doesn't count. What happens is the Small Business Administration will automatically add that $10,000 to your uh, paycheck, your PPP, Paycheck Protection Program loan, and um, you're good. So the 10,000 piece gets added automatically or gets added if you get it into the loan, you're good, you just can't, uh, that's the exception. You cannot do it for the same thing also with independent contractors. Can you get the Paycheck Protection Loan and pay independent contractors? Independent contractors are separately eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program Loan pro uh, so it's, it would not be necessary. And paying independent contractors with your loan money would not qualify you for loan forgiveness. Makes better sense to... Um, encourage them to apply and get their own forgivable loans as well. Another question, and I do not have the answer. I'm going to raise it anyway, because I'm hoping anyone who finds the answer, please report back because it's an important one. If you're a nonprofit and you have certain employees working hundred percent under a government grant, so their line, their flow of, revenue, the money to pay their payroll is covered. Can you get a loan for them? There is no definitive statement on that. 
there's the belief, this is an interpretation by a bunch of smart people that I get to talk to, is that you have to certify you need the loan to make payroll. And if those people are already covered, would you violate that certification that you need the money to pay their salary? That's a question. And separately, uh, government grants may have some, whatever grant you have may have some controlling language over this. Clearly not anything Congress thought of, and clear, um, unfortunately nothing that SBA or Treasury have told us yet. We're asking, and we'll get an answer to that. I hope we will post it on our website as soon as we get it, because I get that question a lot. Okay, Tiff, back to you. To hit okay. So we have some just basic yes, no questions. Uh, do other types of tax-exempt organizations, C2s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s, all of those have been asked about qualify under PPP? No. There's a veterans group that's either C-17 or C-19. I think C-19 that does qualify, but other Cs other than three and 19 do not. Do houses of worship, um, if they... Uh, but, I'm sorry, but federal, they, they likely qualify under the EIDL. That is the... Economic injury. The other types of Cs may qualify yes. under EIDL. Yes. Okay. Um, as for houses of worship, if they receive federal funds, will that imp will that jeopardize their status? No. The frequently asked questions of the Small Business Administration uh, makes clear: no, you are not disadvantaged, and it does not change your relationship with the federal government. Whenever you were figuring out the number of employees for PPP. How do full-time, part-time, and temporary employees count? How do you count them? Full-time and part-time, the statute, uh, the regulations say full-time, part-time, and other status. Uh, the way to calculate if you've been in business for a year is to uh, total up your monthly employment numbers and, and identify an average from there. So if you have a you have a camp that has extra hundred several hundred employees, those average out over the course of the year. Or if you are a seasonal employer, then you are able to select the time period of I believe February fifteenth to, to June thirtieth, twenty nineteen, as the representative period for calculating your usual payroll. No, while you're no, no, while no. you're talking about the time period, what can a, a can an organization use a different time period instead of the calendar year to determine that? Sounds like someone studied the statute. Yes, there are four different ways of calculating depending on how long you've been in business. But the the usual is January first to December thirtieth, twenty nineteen, for the average for payroll for counting of individuals, or you could pick from application date or March 1st, going back to um, March 1st of 2019. So 2020, you can use a 12 month period. You can use a 2019 year, year average or seasonal as I've already described, or if you weren't in business, if you opened up early this year, you can use beginning of the year to Maybe February 15th, I'm not sure which, but it's, um, you can use from January 1st to when you, sh when you shut down. A couple more, yes, no questions. Yes. Do banks include credit unions? Go to a credit yes. union for Yes. Loans? If they're taking the loans, yes. Uh, what if an organization gets federal or state grants? That's the, that goes to the question that I, I addressed. If you get government, federal and state grants, there's no disqualification. If it's clear that five researchers are funded directly by this grant and you report those five employees payroll to the federal government or to the, the government that provided the grant, that's the question I don't know the answer. If it's a general operating support, uh, then that's no different than using uh, donation money, using uh, endowment money. That's just a revenue source. Unless it's earmarked specifically for people, 
it, it doesn't come into account. And then last question, we've had over a thousand questions, so sorry we didn't get to more, but I was trying as hard as possible. Um, one more question that is cl for clarifying, back to the social security number or ownership line in the SBA application, do we have any more clarification on that? They fixed that, and you now can put in the your employer identification EIN number. I don't know if some of the forms still give you a choice, I would hope no one would ever put the social security number on a form uh, in, in any of these operations. You're not personally liable uh, and you're not the owner. So social security numbers should not be used. Okay. Thank you. David, um, I think we are about time. We should probably turn it back over to Tim. Great. Um, Rick, next slide. So we're at the point of taking action. Before we do the taking action, I want to convey my thanks to David Thompson, who has been uh, the sector's expert, been deeply, deeply involved in this. Um, the reason that we are doing this webinar for a second time on a nationwide basis is that we've had several members of Congress ask us to uh, do it again so that we can get information out to their constituents. Um, the, and as we mentioned before, all of the slides and a recording and a list of the uh, materials as updated will be made available to you and put up on the website uh, for you to come back to. Um, but again, I wanna say thank you to David and thanks to the members of Congress who recognize not only putting nonprofits in the bills, but also the need to get information out to nonprofits. Next slide. Again, you have the options uh, of uh, going and applying for these uh, loans, um, and they are available to you. Um, the question is whether there will be funds, whether your institution's doing it. Uh, we can't answer either of those, but um, this is the time to be a squeaky wheel so that you are heard. Um, next slide. I uh, want to conclude by imploring that everybody starts looking not only at what's happening at the federal level, but also at the state level to try to start putting some handles on what's happening at the state level, such as uh, potential changes to charitable giving incentives, um, to government contracts and grants uh, processes, to unemployment insurance to uh, extensions on all sorts of filings and a whole lot more. Uh, we put together a, an article that Nonprofit Quarterly ran today. We will put it up on our website as well, but it, I would encourage you all to look at Nonprofit Quarterly. They actually have two articles about some of the things that are happening at the state level right now that they put out today. They have a, this free um, new center that you can uh, receive materials for. All you have to do is subscribe and it's for free. Again, that's nonprofit quarterly. Just look it up in, um, in, in your search engines. Um, we also post all of this information for free for nonprofits. Uh, our concern is that this should not be a pay to play situation. All this information needs to be freely available. That's how we roll. We want to make sure that the best information possible gets out to nonprofits. And that's not to say that we know the most. Uh, it is to say that we know people who do know, and those are the folks with, at the state associations of nonprofits. And so we tap into their minds across the country to hear and see what's happening and uh, to then get information out. You can also sign up for our two newsletters uh, that are also free. One is on uh, nonprofit advocacy matters concerning public policy issues and the other on uh, operational or capacity building issues, again, both free. Here's a list of resources that are available so that you will be able to go back and check on a frequent basis um, and as you need them. And we will be updating this list. It is on our website. You will be getting it um, as a follow up to the webinar. Um, and please feel free to turn to it at any time. Rick, is that the last slide?
I believe that must be the last slide. I'm not hearing. Uh, so what, what I will simply do is close uh, by thanking everybody uh, and uh, ask you to please pass along thanks. Uh, these are some uh, difficult times for people in our country. I think it's important for us as nonprofit leaders across the, this great nation uh, to be uh, civil, to be modeling the best behavior, to be helping other people, um, and um, using our words as well as our deeds of saying thank you. Uh, so I close today by saying thank you to you all for what you're doing. Um, thank you for participating in today's call. Thank you for what you will be doing for your local communities in the days, weeks, uh, months, and probably years ahead. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day.